Hello, my name is Lee Benson, and I'm one of the interventional cardiologists at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. And I'd like to introduce to you a new system for creation of a controlled perforation in cardiac tissue. And this system can be used in the management of patients with pulmonary atresia, an intact ventricular septum, or in the creation of a transatrial septal defect. Methods for treatment of pulmonary valve atresia uh, with intact uh, ventricular septum uh, include cardiac surgery, transcatheter perforation of the atretic valve using a stiff wire, uh, or perforation using a laser guide wire. More recently, perforation using a radio frequency guide wire followed by balloon dilatation of the valve. Radio frequency perforation has been attempted using a variety of commercially available catheters, including a five French deflectable radio frequency catheter from Webster in the United States, a two French radio frequency catheter called Cerebrate, and more recently a 1.9 French radio frequency perforation wire manufactured by Bayless Medical in Canada. The latter perforation system consists of a radio frequency generator that has been specifically designed for cardiac perforation, a perforation wire, and a coaxial exchange catheter used to exchange for a stiff guide wire once the perforation has been accomplished. I will describe initially in detail the components of the system and then the sequence of operation for producing a controlled cardiac perforation. And as an example, we view with you images from a patient with pulmonary atresia with intact ventricular septum who is treated using this technology. The radio frequency perforation generator is very easy to use. The power output and the duration of power delivery are set using these buttons with settings that can be easily increased or decreased and generated values that are clearly displayed. This generator is unlike RF generators used for electrophysiological pathway ablation as it delivers high intensity electricity and functions within a higher impedance range. The generator is optimized to work in conjunction with this perforation wire to produce a smooth perforation with negligible trauma to surrounding tissue. Using this system, perforation occurs in less than a second with five watts of generated power. The perforation catheter has an outer diameter of 24 thousandths of an inch and is 265 centimeters in length in order to accommodate a 100 centimeter guiding catheter and still have length to load a 145 centimeter long coaxial exchange catheter. The perforation wire is flexible and shapeable and has handling characteristics of a coronary guide wire with a Teflon insulation that facilitates smooth advancement through the guiding system. The atraumatic active tip is 1.5 millimeters in length and is 16 thousandths of an inch in diameter and will not in itself mechanically perforate the tissue. There is no fixed connector at the, on the proximal end. This makes it possible to easily disconnect the catheter from the generator and load the coaxial exchange catheter. The coaxial catheter has a large inner lumen and works as an exchange guide for the floppy tipped wires. It has an outer diameter of 38 thousandths of an inch and an inner diameter of 27 thousandths of an inch. The catheter is 145 centimeters in length, the body constructed of stainless steel coil insulated by a Teflon jacket. It has a 10 centimeter floppy tip with a radio opaque marker and is packaged with a stylet and a removable lure lock hub. The patient is prepared for cardiac catheterization in the usual way uh, under general anesthesia and with a prostaglandin infusion if pulmonary is present. A dispersive electrode pad, similar to that used in electrophysiological studies, is applied to the patient and connected to the generator. A diagnostic catheterization is performed, including a right ventricular gram to define right ventricular morphology, infundibular anatomy, and possible coronary artery involvement. Occasionally, a left ventricular gram or aortogram is required to better define any coronary involvement to rule out a right ventricular dependent coronary circulation. 
We usually obtain the right ventricular study in a biplane cranial caudal lateral projection, a patent infundibulum, and the absence of right ventricular dependent coronary circulation are required to proceed with the perforation. The RF perforation wire is designed to fit through a ca catheter guide system that can accommodate a 38,000 inch wire. A four or five French Judkins right coronary catheter is most often used with a 2.5 curve. For positioning in the right ventricle, a back bleeding tap with a sidearm allows contrast injection. The catheter is introduced into the right ventricle and its positioning confirmed by fluoroscopy. To position the catheter into the infundibulum through the small right ventricle, frequently a counterclockwise rotation is required rather than the clockwise rotation one intuitively would use. The perforation wire can then be introduced and may require a slight curve on its tip to help direct it towards the valve. The perforation wire is advanced through the guide catheter and the distal tip positioned below the atretic valve. Careful monitoring on both planes is necessary to assure the tip of the catheter is pointing at the valve plate in the AP and left to right projections. Often small injections of contrast will help in defining the distal infundibular anatomy. A hand injection of contrast can be used to confirm placement as can transesophageal echocardiography. A variety of other techniques have been described including a retrograde main pulmonary artery injection saved as a roadmap or the placement of a five millimeter radio opaque snare in the main pulmonary artery to help guide catheter positioning. The latter two of course require arterial entry in from the femoral artery which we avoid in the neonate or from the umbilical artery. Once the correct position has been confirmed, perforation can proceed. You'll recall that the proximal end of the perforation wire has no fixed connector. This end is inserted into the catheter end of the connector cable. To make the connection, the red button of the connector is pressed and the catheter inserted into the opening. A gentle pull on the catheter will confirm a secure connection. The other end of the cable is connected to the generator. The generator is turned on using a switch at the back and the power level and duration can be set using the controls on the front. The recommended initial setting is five watts of power for two seconds. The generator can be activated and deactivated by pressing the on off button at the front of the generator or by depressing a foot switch. While energy is being delivered, firm pressure is applied to the perforation catheter to make contact with the valve plate and subsequent perforation. If uh, you're unsuccessful uh, with perforation, the same energies can be applied a second or even a third time, or occasionally the power may be increased. I generally go to seven watts for three seconds uh, with unsuccessful previous perforations. Uh, because the active tip is small, the hole that is created is less than 16 thousandths of an inch in diameter and will close easily. This is particularly important as inadvertent perforation into the pericardium will generally not lead to a hemodynamically compromising tamponade and further attempts at perforation can be performed with readjustment of the guide catheter. After valve perforation has occurred, the wire should be advanced across the area of perforation into the main or one of the branch pulmonary arteries. The end of the perforation wire is disconnected from the connector cable and the coaxial catheter is loaded over the wire. The coaxial ca catheter is packaged with a stylet which should be of course removed. The catheter is flushed prior to loading to facilitate a smooth advancement over the perforation wire. The coaxial catheter with a 27,000 inch inner diameter and a 38,000 inch outer diameter is advanced through the guiding catheter over the perforation wire and tracks across the area of perforation. It should be carefully advanced so it does not dislodge the perforation catheter 
from its position across the atretic valve. With the coaxial catheter across the valve, either, a, either in a branched pulmonary artery or main pulmonary artery, the perforation wire can be removed and exchanged for a stiffer wire using a, usually a 14,000th inch coronary guide and maneuvered into and through the arterial duct. This maneuver gives the wire more torque to allow passage of a small 2 or 2.5 millimeter balloon for the initial dilation. Occasionally, the, the wire must be snared from the arterial circulation or maneuvered into the descending aorta and into the femoral artery. From there, external compression on the artery will stabilize the wire and help in passing the first balloon catheter through the perforation. Alternatively, the hub can be removed from the coaxial catheter and it can be used as a rail to guide a dilation catheter that accepts a 38,000 inch wire. The injection is made in the slight cranial uh, angulation of the right ventricle demonstrating the atretic pulmonary valve and tricuspid regurgitation and the uh, well expanded infundibulum a five right coronary catheter is positioned underneath the valve plate and confirmed both in the AP and lateral projections to be in the mid portion uh, of the valve. Subsequently, the perforation uh, takes place and a coronary guide wire positioned in the main pulmonary artery uh, and then maneuvered down the arterial duct to guide the angioplasty catheter through the valve plate for the angioplasty. And finally, the right ventricular injection at the conclusion demonstrating uh, patency of the right ventricular oxygen tract. I hope this introduction to the radio frequency perforation system has been informative. Thank you very much.